Hello and welcome back to Leader Up, a podcast of Army Management Staff College. Leader Up is a professional conversation where we discuss a broad range of leadership and leader development topics with an emphasis on the Army civilian professional. I'm your host, David Howie. On today's episode of Leader Up, we have a very special guest. This is Ms. Sally Finning, and she is a member of the Senior Executive Service, and she is the Director, Resources Integration, Office of the Deputy Chief of Staff, G9. And we're going to talk today to Ms. Finning about the G9 and and her role in, in the G9. And we're going to also talk a little bit about how she became a member of the Senior Executive Service and about some other leadership and leader development topics. So, Miss Sally Finning, welcome to Leader Up, and thank you for being here today. Hey, good morning, David. Thanks um, so much for having me. It's really, um, it's really a privilege to be able to uh, sit down with you, and uh, it's incredibly humbling uh, to believe that anybody would want to hear about my personal career in history. So. Uh, I'm just really excited to uh, to be able to talk about kind of the roads that 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 led here um, and some of the uh, thoughts and ideas that I have uh, about that and maybe where we're going in the future. So thanks so much uh, again for having me. Well, you're more than welcome. And I know that uh, on behalf of our leader up audience out there that uh, we appreciate hearing from you. And so let's just kind of start off with what you're doing now, your job now as uh, part of the G9, and kind of what is your job and maybe a little bit about what the G9 is? Yeah, sure. So, you know, first, uh, you know, one of the things I'm going to talk about a little bit later is that uh, I could have never predicted the road uh, that landed me where I am now. Uh, I started out my career doing um, environmental restoration, wanting to, uh, the goal was to save the Everglades. And so the path that led me to being a resource manager overseeing um, all of the, all of the finances and money associated with all of our army installations uh, has been a, 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 a very interested and not necessarily straight path. Um, and in my role for the army G9, And so for some people, G9 is a little bit of a question mark. G9, we are the advocates for installations uh, in the Pentagon. So everything to do with family services, um, all everything it takes to run a city um, and 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 housing um, for barracks, for soldiers, um, everything you see on our army installations. Um, that is the portfolio that I have. It's about $85 billion um, over the five-year span that we look at and we plan and program from, from the Pentagon. But the key role is that we we are the headquarters for installations for the Army in the Pentagon. And and that role for the Army, that that installation oversight role, that, that installation integration role, um, one of the things that, that I've seen personally over the past 20 years since what was back then was called IMA and now is uh, uh, Installation Management Command. Um, one of the things that, that I saw, and I'll just ask, your, ask to get your uh, view on this, is that that called upon Army civilians to be way more uh, involved in managing installations because so many of our um, positions – uh, and I'm going back 15 and 20 years ago, went from being military to being civilians. So where you had a, a lieutenant colonel in a position, uh, it became a civilian, a 13 or a GS-13. And so I'm kind of leading into a question about your view of how the role of the Army civilians has changed uh, o- over uh, your career, the time that you've spent with the Army. Yeah, so... I haven't spent my career working as a resource manager. I actually spent my career working as an engineer. Um, and what we saw is exactly what you said, David. Our um, our DPWs, our directors of public works, were previously military uh, 
personnel. And during the during the um, high op tempo uh, that was going on in the early 2000s, the the idea to civilianize as many positions as possible um, was out there. And so that was happening to this entire um, essentially career profession, which was being a, an engineer and a member of the engineer branch um, running installations. And so all of that became civilianized, and I eventually took those uh, positions. Uh, I was a GS-15 um, public works director, formerly a position that had been held by a colonel. Um, and there were a lot of adjustments that that had to be made, uh, one in terms of um, how, how the military was communicating with that civilian that used to be a military. Um, and, and so there was some learning side learning that had to take place on the military side, because I'm used to, you know, commanding this civil, this military to do something. And now I'm having to work with civilians, which was very different for them. And so, so that, so that shifted and changed it a little bit on the civilian side. It gave us a lot of opportunity that we didn't have previously. Um, and I think that it also gave us um, opportunities to deploy uh, with the military that we didn't have in the past. Those military positions were the ones that the military leaned on uh, to set up and manage installations. Um, and now they were civilians. And so more and more, they're looking to the civilians um, to deploy and to run those roles. And so um, that crossover has been a really, um, a really interesting dynamic. And And what you're talking about um, is has necessitated uh, an increase in the amount of leadership and leader development that Army civilians need, that they need so that they can go into those leadership positions. And I just would like to hear more of your opinion about why leadership and leader development are important for us as members of the Army civilian profession. Yeah, so so uh, you know, being in the position to run large organizations that we didn't run before uh, certainly calls for some some additional um, leadership skills to move uh, move the masses uh, in a way. I think, um, and I'll I'll surely talk more about this, but um, I think I I came to a a very quick conclusion, um, maybe faster in my career than I might have otherwise, um, that, hey, it's, it's all about, it's all about people. Um, it's all about um, understanding the people who work for you, um, understanding their dreams and their goals, and then fitting all of those puzzle pieces together to, to move some, to move something forward. Um, leadership is so incredibly important. And, you know, I think um, I think that the the one thing that I've always kind of thought about is this this watching other leaders and watching what happens to them uh, when they choose to lead in one way or choose to lead in another way. Um, and I think it becomes really, really important to always stay open um, to to looking at yourself honestly and humbly. Uh, in order to always kind of be aware of where where your leadership style is working well uh, or where it isn't working well and kind of how you um, how you adjust yourself and your style to fit the situation that you're you're working in and the the level that you're at uh, what kind of challenges or issues or opportunities do you see when you are at the enterprise level of the army uh, and leading at that level, what kind of challenges or issues do you experience at that level? So, so it, it has been interesting when I, when I look back um, each time I stepped up to a next level, I wished that I had understood and listened to my colleagues better. So for example, when I was, a DPW and I was working with the MWR, um, the morale and welfare people, I, it felt very much like a competition, 
Like we were competing for the organization's funds against each other. Uh, and then I ended up becoming the deputy garrison commander, which was the boss of those people. And I just wished that they had been more cooperative and less competitive. Um, and I felt that at every single level that I've ever worked at is when I look, when I get up to the next step and I look down, I wish that I had been more cooperative uh, and less competitive. And now I'm at the army level and I'm absolutely certain if I were ever to go to the DOD level and I look down, I would wish that um, that the the Army and the Air Force or the Navy had not been so competitive with one another. And so I think when you start to say, okay, at the enterprise level, at the Army enterprise level, um, it really is about checking our general human nature to want to compete to have the best organization that we can have which is, you know, it's instinctual. You want to get as many resources and make things work as best as you can with what you have uh, to also be aware of looking at, well, I need to be cognizant of not competing with uh, and taking away from others that might need it because I'm potentially a better competitor. Um, really think about what's the balance and what's the right thing. Um, and maybe even if that means putting a little bit of sacrifice onto your own team because it's the better thing for the enterprise level. Um, I think that's a very hard thing to learn because it goes against a bit of our instinct uh, to do the best we can for our people. And one thing that I'd like to ask you about is you are a member of the Senior Executive Service and there's a symbol that's used. It's on the, the flag. It's, and it's a symbol that represents the senior executive service. And I just would like to hear from you. What does that symbol, that, that stone, what does that mean to you? Yeah. So as an engineer, I love the fact that they picked uh, a, a, a principal structural uh, component as the emblem for the senior executive service. Um, the keystone is is the the stone that goes in to, on top of an arch from the from the Roman construction times, um, and and the idea that a key, a keystone in itself is essentially a rock laying on the ground, uh, it means nothing. Um, but but when it is a keystone that is part of this structural arch that is made up of all of the components, it becomes this critical. Uh, element that 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 stabilizes and and holds things in place. And so, when I think about um, you know, it, it it reminds me of my military co colleagues that are stones that move in and out. Uh, it reminds me of the staff and the structure that holds the organization up and together. And so, I think it was um, I think it's a pretty uh, a pretty wonderful symbol of um, that that really important um, stability and, and leadership role that the civilians, um, that the civilians senior leaders have in the army uh, and across the DOD. And I'd like to ask you about uh, two things that, that I used to hear a lot about in the classroom. I taught in the basic course and the intermediate course in the uh, civilian education system. And there were two topics that kind of came up a lot and they are delegation and feedback. And I'll, I'm going to ask you about delegation first. Why is that important? What does it mean to you? And is it still important for you as a member of the senior executive service? Yeah. So of course, of course, delegation is important. Otherwise you're only as good as what you can do in eight hours of a day. Um, I think that delegation is is part of, uh, and I'll, I'll I'll address feedback separate. But delegation is also part of the feedback loop. Um, you when you delegate, uh, you give your your staff um, or another organization potentially um, the opportunity to to show what they're capable of um, to to um, respond. Uh, with their skills and their talents, and they can add to what you've uh, provided. Um, I think it's just, you know, it's, it's, you know, back to the discussion about the keystone, without the rest of the rocks, you, you really have nothing. Um, and so, so delegation is, is, is critical. 
uh, it's hard to delegate without trust. And so delegation becomes part of the trust feedback loop. The more you do it, the more comfortable you become with it. Um, the more you learn um, what what is is and is not delegatable, the more effective you will be. Uh, I I don't do anything uh, if I can possibly delegate it. I don't do anything unless the answer is, "Are you the only person that can do this?" Uh, I ask myself that question with everything that comes into my box. If I am the only person that can do this, that is what I do. Uh, and if I if I am not, if somebody else could do this, then I will delegate it. Um, that doesn't mean that I don't do, you know, I still print my own stuff and staple my own packets because it might be Saturday afternoon and there's no one else around. And the answer to, are you the only person that can do this? is absolutely yes. Um, but I am always asking myself that question. Um, I'm not asking myself, am I the best person to do this? Right? Because if we ask ourselves that question, we might be confused into always thinking that we are. Um, and so the more you delegate, the more you start to learn that there are other people who are definitely smarter than you and definitely have more experience than you in different things. And they come back with, with better answers. So uh, I highly recommend it. <laughs> and something that I've, I've learned is that uh, when you do delegate, you find out people's capacity. You, you find out, I have seen what people can do when, when I delegate something to them. I see what they can do, what they're capable of. And uh, anything else on uh, feedback? Um, go yeah, ahead, ma'am. So, uh, you know, in fact, I just told my boss, just the other day that feedback is a gift uh, and I love feedback, but today is a bad day for it, right? And so uh, feedback is is really, really important. And uh, I think it's one of the hardest things for us uh, as people, you know, to not let feedback do one of two things, um, make you sad and demotivate you or make you angry and defensive. Um, and so one of the most important things about feedback, and you don't always get to choose when you're going to have it, uh, but if you have good communication and good relationship and you know it's coming, you can potentially, as I did, ask for it to come maybe tomorrow. Um, that uh, feedback is the thing that helps us uh, to be better. Um, a lot of times we have a sense that we need feedback. Um, and the braver we become and the more likely we are to ask for it, the more likely we are to grow. Um, so when you get that sinking feeling that something didn't go well and feedback might be coming, um, you know, that's the moment that you you can toughen up and walk in and say, I would I would like uh, I would like some feedback. Um, it's very different for every person when and how they can receive it. And I mean, it can be given to you at any time and whether you're going to deflect it or whether you're going to accept it, um, that's very different for, for everyone. Um, so it's always best to ask for it because when you ask for it, you're, you're, you're ready to receive it. And that, uh, your, your very first, uh, response to that feedback is a gift. That's very true because, we give gifts to people that we care about and uh, we give feedback when, when we care about the relationship, we're willing to, to offer feedback to people. Uh, and that's, we talked about that lots and lots in the basic course and the intermediate course. And I, I appreciate uh, you responding to that. And so let me kind of take this in a little different direction. We, you talked earlier about uh, a little bit about where you're working now how did you get to be a member of the senior executive service? What kind of path did, did you follow to get you to where you are today? Yeah. So I never, well, of course started my career and didn't know what the senior executive service was. Um, in fact, probably went through half of my career before I really understood what it might be. Uh, it was never, something that I ever thought about or aspired to. Um, you know, my my path to becoming an SES was 
um, you know, nose down, color, solve people's problems. Um, it was my perspective. Um, and, and what I found um, was the more I paid attention and tried to solve problems, um, the more confident I became as, as I was able to do so. I often was, you know, in the position to step into my boss's job. Um, I learned to be very frank and honest um, at some point. And that's not to say that people aren't frank and honest, but the tendency, um, the tendency to not deliver bad news or hard news to senior leaders, for some reason, I just didn't have it in me. Uh, I couldn't let a leader walk out of the room if they were getting the wrong information. Um, and so somewhere along the line, I, I came up with a very strong uh, sense of, um, you know, I'm going to be the one who, 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 who tells the truth uh, and gives solutions. Uh, you can't just go in and say, you can't do this. You can't do this. You can't do this. You have to go in and say, well, I understand where you're trying to go. And that path, you know, may, may run into some significant issues. Here's another path that I think will be more successful to get you where you, you want to go. Uh, learning how to deliver those messages uh, and not being afraid to speak up in any situation. Um, uh, I think that the nose down and color, uh, you know, do work, work hard, find answers. Um, that gave me a base of knowledge and information with which I could speak with confidence um, about what would work and what, what wouldn't work. Um, and so I think, um, I think it really was that. You know, you, you know, you, I had a, a, a senior mentor uh, earlier on in my career, who's now a four star. Um, and I, I called him up and I said, Hey, you know, I'm scared. I'm going to brief the vice chief of staff of the army. Um, and, you know, I don't know this person and how should I brief? And I'm, you know, you know how I am. I'm really frank and honest. And he, he talked to me and he's like, look, you always, it doesn't matter what level you're briefing, you always have to be frank and honest. And he said, but Sally, you don't have to be a jerk about it. And I was like stunned. And he said, sometimes you just need to soften it up a little bit. Um, and so, so I think being really frank and honest is really important, but that, that need to develop relationships where you get feedback and it's clear and it's straight. Uh, same individual told me, you know what? Sometimes, you know, you don't have to answer every question. We know you're smart. You don't have to answer everything. Sometimes your silence says more. And I was just kind of like, hmm. Um, I think it's really important to lean on and develop those relationships that where people will be, you know, really honest with you so that you can build your skills along the way. And I, I would say that, um, you know, it's about building skills. It's about building relationships, uh, and it's about you know protecting and taking care of your reputation. Um, you know, do, doing the right thing, saying the right thing, and gui guiding people in in successful directions. And is there any anything other than all of that that you would offer to uh, folks in the Army Civilian Corps who say they want to pursue a career as a member of the Senior Executive Service? advice for them that that things that they could focus on or look at someone who's in their mid 30s or early 40s who wants to to be a member of the senior executive service yeah i think um i think the first thing uh i would always say if somebody came to me and said you know i'd really like to be an ses and i want more information i think the first question i would ask is you know well why um, you know, why are you saying that you want to be an SES? Because if it looks like fame and glory, there's none of that here. <laughs> um, if, you know, there, you know, it, it can look more glamorous than it, than it is, or certainly that it feels. Um, but if the reason is, and for me, the reason was, was always about um, feeling like I want to 
influence more. I want to solve bigger problems. I want to help more. I want to step up to that next level. Um, then that that really is the that really is the right um, the right reason. Uh, you know, we already talked about um, the advice I would give is figure out ways to build relationships where you can get honest feedback because it is that honest feedback that's going to make you better and better and better. Um, and so that would be, you know, don't take yourself seri too seriously because failure is a part of the journey. Um, seek the feedback and, and make sure that you're doing it or that you want to be in it for the right reasons. And that's for, from a selfless perspective that you're ready to pay back. Uh, to an organization that has 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 um, invested in you over your career. A couple of months ago, I saw a presentation that you did in in one of our CES programs, a CES course, and uh, you shared a photograph of yourself that I think was from your uh, first grade photograph, and you had comments from your like your report card uh, from your first grade teacher and. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll let you characterize them a little bit more, but I would say that they were not flattering uh, <laughs> comments. And so, the what was the purpose for you as a member of the Senior Executive Service to share that with uh, other members of the Army Civilian Corps? And, and what other wh whatever other message that you'd like to give to our leader up audience about that? Um, so why did you share that and, wh and what's the, what's the relevance of all of that? Yeah. So I wish, I, I wish this wasn't a podcast and we could flip it up on the screen, but, um, so, so yeah, um, I had, a both, both my kindergarten and my first grade report cards, uh, looked pretty similar. Um, and basically I was, um, pretty sloppy, messy, um, a little bit, um, cantankerous, uh, arguing about school rules and, um, and frustrated and crying and everything you could think of. And I actually can't imagine a teacher giving someone a report card like that today, but it was mine and it, it was real. Um, and I did that for a few reasons. Um, the first reason is that I still feel every day uh, when I go into a room to get a briefing uh, that I am a child sitting in the corner and I have faked my way into this. Uh, I am going to next week be briefing the secretary on all of the money uh, of the army, of all of the money on all of the installations uh, and recommendations for investments, et cetera. And I will still go into that room feeling like I am a child that doesn't belong there. And I know that there are a lot of people that feel that way. And when I see this picture of this child, um, you know, I see the vulnerable person that makes made mistakes. Um, and that's in a lot of ways, the same person I, I am today. Uh, I still get my feelings hurt when people give me feedback. Um, and I still make some of the same mistakes that I made as a child. My things are still on the floor. I'm still, I still argue about, you know, army rules. Um, and, and what I wanted people to know is that you don't have to change who you are. I believe that being your best and most authentic person is, is, absolutely critical to your success. Um, I believe that my messiness leads to my creativity. I believe the inquisitive person who doesn't just follow rules, but asks about them, um, helps accomplish and get things done. So many of those things that were a problem became part of my success. Um, I wanted to bring out the discussion about imposter syndrome, which um, we did have a few people who discussed that they suffer from that uh, and that I do and that my mother does and men do, women do. We all have uh, some, many of us suffer from some element of that. And I wanted to bring out that discussion and have that um, discussion. 
Um, I think the difference now for me is, although I I still feel that thing about being a little kid in the room, um, today I sort of laugh about it instead of stress about it. Um, of course, that's the way I feel. Um, and now I think, well, maybe it's because I'm so young and youthful, but maybe uh, that's not the case anymore. Um, but I laugh about it instead of uh, stressing about it. And, uh, and I recognize that it's something real that so many people um, suffer from, but it doesn't mean that it should ever stop you. It just be aware of it, ignore it, laugh about it and move on. And, and that's reality. That's, that's, uh, you've talked a lot about uh, the truth uh, and what's objective. And that, that's some, for some people, that is their reality that they feel that way. And um, the best thing to do is to deal with it and acknowledge it. Like you, like you just said, and I, I, I congratulate you and I, I thank you for, for sharing that part of yourself uh, in that class and also with our leader up audience. And I, I, I believe that uh, there are lots of people out there who uh, have that phenomenon going on uh, and they do suffer from that imposter syndrome. So absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. And we're coming to the end of our time. And I want to ask you, I got, I got four more questions uh, and they are our leader up top threes. And so the first one is what are your, if you could recommend some, reading some books to folks out in the army civilian Corps, and you had three books that you could recommend, what would be your top three leadership books? Yeah. So the first one, um, is, uh, is the, the speed of trust. Um, you know, I, I enter into every situation and every new job and position, uh, from a footing of trust. Uh, and, and that means that I offer it uh, everywhere I go. Uh, it doesn't mean uh, that every once in a while I don't get bit by it because 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 I, I have. Um, but the the speed and efficiency um, that comes from offering trust um, completely overwhelms any amount of somebody got you and you had to take a step back. Um, and so, so trust is absolutely important. And that book dives into um, experiencing and understanding why we might distrust people uh, and giving you a perspective on how to, how to work through that. Uh, it's a great book. I've done leader, group leadership with my teams uh, on it. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a really great book. Um, eaters, uh, I'm sorry, eaters, <laughs> leaders eat last is, uh, a book about humility. Uh, it's a book about service leadership. Um, it's a, it's a, it's an easy read, uh, and, and, and entertaining, but you know, it's, it's trust the first off. And then that second thing about humility and, and how you um, approach the people who work with and work around you. Um, and then the last one um, is a little bit spicy. Uh, it's a book called Radical Candor. Um, and it has to do with um, the hardest thing we'll ever do uh, is to carefully, honestly, and tactfully tell somebody something they don't want to hear, um, how to deliver feedback, when to do it, what's the right way to do it, um, and, uh, and, and how, how you work through it. And I say it's a little spicy. Some of the language she uses is a little bit, is a little bit off there. So it's not for everyone, um, but it really gets after that. Um, how do you say the hard things and how do you help people be better? Um, because there's two sides to feedback. One, you have to, you have to be able to receive it. Uh, the other thing is that you have to learn when and how to give it, uh, so it can be received. So, um, I think that's a, that's a really, uh, another quick, easy read, uh, pretty entertaining, uh, uh, book there. So that, that right now is, is my, is my top, top three, uh, leader books that are, that are out there. And your top three recommended skills or competencies for army leaders? Yeah. So, um, I don't, so the first one I would say is that 
in order to be a leader and if you want to be a leader, you, you have to genuinely like and care about people. Uh, that has to be genuine and come from your heart. Uh, otherwise, you have no business leading people. Um, and so so really that uh, ability to, to have a general sense of feeling and caring uh, for the people that work for you and work um, around you. Um, the second one is like, and I'm, I'm not sure if these are technically competencies, but um, never take anything personally. Uh, I think people who take things personally, they create vendettas and they create uh, teams and us against them. And it's never, it, it takes away from when you, when you take something personally instead of professionally, uh, even if it was delivered personally, you have a choice to not take it that way, um, to continue to balance um, and, and stay focused on, you know, why you're there, uh, what purpose you're trying to, uh, um, what, what your purpose is and what you're trying to move forward. So, uh, you know, lots of things are going to happen. Uh, things are going to feel personal. Sometimes they are going to be, and sometimes it's going to be a perception that just isn't true. And so if you just say, you know what, it's never personal uh, when it's coming at me, then then you'll be um, better off. Uh, and then the last one is like, you know, just persistence. Failure is part of it. Failure is part of success. Um, and, you know, we're, we're going to fall down, but Really, your success depends not on how many times you fall down, but how many times you get back up. And I know that sounds cliche, um, but people never remember the thing that you tried to do that didn't work. You get remembered for the things that did work. And so the more times you just get back up and go, then, um, you know, the more the more successful you will ultimately be. And so those are kind of the three things that I that I think about. You know, it's about caring about other people. Uh, it's about not making it a personal fight or a personal uh, a personal thing. It's all about, you know, the mission and what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, and then, you know, just dealing with failure, brush it off, move on and get back up and, and, and go for it. And then your top three skills or competencies for enterprise leaders, uh, if they're different, if, if, uh, if they're different from the three that you just listed out or what yeah, you would add. They're a little bit different, but very, very related. Um, you know, empathy, right? Empathy is absolutely necessary. And it's part of what helps you understand and to understand and care about, um, to care about people. And so the ability to either get into the shoes of one of your staff or to try and sit in the seat of another organization that you're trying to work with, the ability to put yourself there and understand the feelings and the tensions is really, really, um, is really, really a critical um, skill. And then patience, right? Uh, not everything needs to happen right now. You don't need to say it right now. Um, you don't need revenge if somebody poked you right now probably ever. Um, and, and so it's really just about, um, you know, learning a sense of strategic patience. Um, when I was younger, I certainly didn't have that. That's definitely a skill that over time I have had to learn and develop is, you know, just sit back the longer in some ways, you know, my mom used to tell me, you know, if you can't make a decision, it's because maybe it's not time. Um, and so sometimes getting a little more information um, is is important. Um, and, you know, with a little time, things don't ever seem quite as dramatic. Um, and so learning when to act and uh, when to to sit back, uh, learning that sense of patience. And then the last one is op optimism. Um, I've I've used the term um, obnoxiously optimistic. Um we have to assume the best in everyone, the best in their intentions, the best in our own abilities, our capabilities, what we want to do. You always have to set in with a mindset that you can be successful. Proceed as if success is inevitable. I think I saw that on a card somewhere. Um, we have to be optimistic and lead that and lead other people um, with that mindset. And, um, you know, the success will breed more optimism and and so uh, optimism is 
probably the third one. It is the third one. And then our final uh, top three is your top three leadership lessons learned. Yeah. So I think, um, so both to kind of say leadership and what got me here, um, you have to be flexible and selfless. Um, and you know, my, the path from being, um, wanting to save the world and do environmental restoration to, um, to overseeing money and finance for installations. Um, it was never, um, it was never the path that I laid out. Um, I always lay out, I always have a, you know, an answer to where do you want to be in five years? What's your path? Um, and it seems like, God steps in and tells me there's a different direction. And so I always remain flexible and open to where am I needed? um, Where are my skills best set for? And I've let my career kind of show me down that path instead of trying to control it. Um, So I think being flexible and then being selfless you know, maybe I've taken jobs I didn't really want because I believed um, that that was where the army needed me. Um, and and I was rewarded by quickly moving on from that job. Um, but, but over and over again, and when I look back, I couldn't have gotten where I got unless I had taken that, um, taken that opportunity on. So um, being flexible and being selfless. Um, the other lesson learned is, wow, um, reputations, they're everything. Um, my reputation is bigger than my own ability from what I perceive. Um, and uh, and it, it comes from um, being kind and trying to help everyone who needs something from you. Um, your reputation is built by people that you have no idea who they are or where they are, uh, how you touched them or how you worked with them. Um, and it builds up over time. Uh, and my reputation has probably gotten every promotion for me um, because it goes out in front of you. And so really being careful about how you treat people, no matter who they are, no matter where they are, um, is, is really, really important. Um, and, and a great reputation in the end will, it, it, it builds your power and it builds your influence and allows you to affect more. Um, so just like any other skill, like learning an engineering skill or an engineering trade, um, the, the, that reputation can, can help, help move you forward. And it, and it comes off of treating people well comes from working very hard, keeping your nose down, coloring, coming up with solutions. Um, and uh, I think it's it, it it's more than I ever would have thought it could have been. And I as I watched it grow, it was a little bit frightening. Uh, and it's frightening today because I chase after trying to kind of keep up with uh, with it. And it takes a lot of energy um, to 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 go out of your way when you don't need to to get your job done. Um, but helping other people get their jobs done is important. Um, and then the third one, I, I kind of already talked about it. It really doesn't matter if you feel like a child. Um, uh, learning how to just put your personal things aside and understand them, know them, laugh at them. Uh, but at the same time, they don't they don't have to get in your way. I would say those are the things that I've learned along the way. And so, Miss Sally Finning, I want to thank you so much for being with us today on Leader Up, and I appreciate you uh, sharing honestly from your heart your thoughts about leadership and how you got to where you are today. Thanks, David. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Leader Up audience, what did you hear today that that resonates with you? What what kind of things did she talk about that that have meaning for you? Please reflect on those and let us know if you have uh, comments, uh, if you have ideas, and join us again next time for another edition of Leader Up. As always, if you have any questions or feedback or would like to learn more about our podcast, please check the description for our email and for our website. Thanks for listening.